Hello everyone, and welcome to the Unit 13 on Basin Scale Implementation. I'm recording this lecture from Australia, from a small town in the Murray-Darling Basin called Deniliquin, an agricultural town, where irrigated rice forms one of the major commodities grown in the district. And it is then processed through the largest rice mill in the Southern Hemisphere, which is situated right in the centre of town. As is typical of the variable environment in all of Australia, this area just recorded one of its hottest Novembers on record, then ended the month receiving a third of its annual rainfall in just two days, highlighting the extreme variability of the Murray-Darling Basin. When white settlers first started arriving in the basin, from a European perspective, it was one of the most food insecure places in the world. They then set about modifying the basin into a heavily regulated basin through weirs, dams, locks and a lot of land use changes and succeeded in transforming the basin to allow Australia to become one of the most food secure countries in the world as it is today. But at a very big cost to the function and the resilience of the natural environment and its people. The basin is now home to two million people and forms a complex social ecological system where water reform has been occurring for many decades. The story of the Murray-Darling Basin and implementation of environmental flows forms the basis of today's lecture. Basin context, physical and ecological. The Murray-Darling Basin is large. It covers over 1 million square kilometres approximately 14% of the total area of mainland Australia. It is one of the most variable river basins in the world for both rainfall and for runoff. Droughts and floods, often following each other, are a common attribute of the basin. The basin averages just 457 millimetres of rain a year, with less than 5% runoff. An average annual flow of the River Murray the largest river in the Murray-Darling Basin, is only about 16% of that of the Nile and just 0.25% of the Amazon. However, the basin is diverse and unique. It includes over 30,000 wetlands that support biodiversity of national and international significance, including one World Heritage Site and 16 wetlands, listed under the Convention on Wetlands of International Importance. That is the Ramsar Convention. Basin context, social and economic. Over 2 million people live in and rely on the basin's water resources, with an additional 1.3 million outside the basin, who are also fully or partly dependent on the supply of the water from the basin delivered through major pipeline systems. Currently, the basin is very diverse with a long history of an indigenous people living and depending on the water resources, and within the last 200 years, high levels of immigration into the basin has occurred from people from all corners of the globe. The basin covers five states and territory governments who, according to the constitution, are responsible for managing water resources. The Murray-Darling Basin contains over 40% of all Australian farms and produces one third of Australia's food supply, contributing over a third of Australia's total gross value of agricultural production. Three quarters of Australia's irrigated crops and pastures are also grown in the basin. River regulation and history of change. Since European settlement of the Murray-Darling Basin in the mid 1840s, river regulation has occurred to control and store water for consumptive uses. This includes irrigation, manufacturing and domestic use. Due to the variability within the basin, hundreds of dams and weirs were placed on nearly all of the river systems in the basin. The major two regulating structures were the Hume Dam, which was completed in the 1930s, and the Dartmouth Dam, which was actually completed in the 1970s, both aimed at drought proofing the basin and then allowing for a stable supply of water for both domestic and irrigation purposes. Although land use change and river regulation aided in securing food and water for the basin, impacts on the natural environment were significant. 
And by the 1980s, it was clear that the current water management at a basin scale was not sustainable. The road towards water reform and environmental flows. Although water reform had been occurring in the basin for over 100 years, it wasn't until the 1980s that basin states came together with the Commonwealth Government to start to work on the deterioration of water dependent ecosystems in the basin, forming the Murray Darling Basin Commission, the MDBC. This eventually led to the Council of Australian Governments recognising the environment as a legitimate user of water in 1994. In 2004, the National Water Initiative was formed and under the Living Murray program, approximately 500 gigalitres or 500 million cubic metres of water was acquired for environmental flow purposes to be managed for maintaining the health of six icon sites. In addition, Water management structures were either built or modified to improve the targeted delivery of environmental flows to these sites. In 2007, the Commonwealth Water Act was established to provide the statutory basis for managing the water resources in the Murray-Darling Basin. The Act required a whole of basin plan to be established and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, the MDBA, was established to develop and oversee the implementation of the Basin Plan. And the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder, or the CHU, an independent statutory office would manage the Commonwealth Water Holdings. The Water Act required the long-term average sustainable diversion limits, SDLs, to be established to represent the maximum long-term annual average quantities of water that could be taken on a sustainable basis from basin water resources as a whole. In 2010, the Guide to the Basin Plan was released, with considerable controversy within irrigation communities, but it was eventually signed into law in 2012, and would see the acquisition of 2,750 gigalitres of water to be used for environmental water purposes. This water is owned by the Commonwealth Government but it is delivered in a collaborative manner, working in with the basin state, states and other water users. Unlike passive environmental flow use, where water is simply left in the river, this environmental water is being actively managed in consideration of other water users, and it's there to try and meet the overall basin plan objective of achieving a healthy working basin through integrated water management of the water resources. Environmental Flows and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan To achieve the outcomes envisioned by the Basin Plan, the environmental water requirements of the Basin Plan have been defined across a range of flow components, from protection and restoration of base flows to overbank flows, and particularly through the introduction of greater variability by generating pulse flows or in-channel freshes. To do this at a basin scale, 122 hydrological indicator sites were chosen as a representative locations for key ecosystem functions related to the full range of flow components throughout the basin. The hydrologic indicator site method then focused on determining the environmental water needs for a number of these indicator sites with the assumption that if these were met the environmental water needs of a broader suite of key environmental assets, functions and ecosystem services would also be met. Three main groups of flow types were targeted for environmental flow watering requirements. These were bankful and overbank flows, freshers and base or low flows. Depending on what has changed in any given location, one or more of these flow groupings would be needed to be either increased or restored. In order to determine the volumetric requirements, the ecological need for a flow is described based on the desired flow rate, the duration that this flow is required for, and how often this flow needs to occur.
Environmental watering plans. To aid in managing environmental water, environmental watering plans are included in the basin plan and provide the management framework for environmental watering across the basin, setting out processes to coordinate the use of environmental water held by various parties, including the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder. The environmental watering plan sets out the overall environmental objectives for water dependent ecosystems the targets by which to measure progress towards the objectives, a management framework for environmental watering, methods for identifying environmental assets and ecosystem functions that will require environmental watering and working out their environmental watering requirements, principles and methods for deciding environmental watering priorities, principles for carrying out environmental watering, and planning for recovery of additional environmental water. In implementing the environmental watering plan, local knowledge, in particular governments partnering with local and regional communities and organisations, is also supposed to play a key role in how environmental water is planned and managed. The management and delivery of environmental water in the Murray-Darling Basin. The delivery of environmental water is achieved through a collaborative manner where the Commonwealth Environmental Water Office and state water holders make water available and deliver water together with river operators, managers, non-government organisations and their local delivery partners. Although the majority of environmental water is owned and managed by the Commonwealth, the water is delivered through agreements with the different basin states. Although states have different implementing strategies, they are similar in that they are usually multi-stakeholder driven with consideration of other users and upstream and downstream users. In the state of Victoria, the Victoria Environmental Water Holder manages environmental water delivery in collaboration with other key stakeholders. In the state of New South Wales, the Office of Environment and Heritage manages environmental water and uses Environmental Water Advisory Groups, EWAGs, to help coordinate the management and the delivery of environmental water. And these EWAGs contain a number of different stakeholder groups, ranging from river operators to local community groups. Monitoring and evaluation of environmental flows. Monitoring and evaluation forms a key component of environmental water delivery within the Murray-Darling Basin, with a focus on collecting information to better inform decision making on delivery and reaching the proposed outcomes within the plan. The Long-Term Intervention Monitoring Program, LTIM, has been established to monitor and evaluate different watering actions and is managed by the Commonwealth Environmental Water Office under their Monitoring, Evaluation, Reporting and Improvement Framework, the MERI Framework. For example, if a flow is being delivered to encourage native fish breeding to occur, it will be accompanied by a monitoring program where scientists may be sent out to set fish egg and larval fish nets to monitor the event and to assess if the fish did breed. If fish did breed, the monitoring program should include follow-up studies to assess if the fish that did breed, their offspring, are now contributing to the overall population of that particular native fish group. The positive outcomes and the unintended consequences since implementation of the Basin Plan began. Five years into the implementation of the Basin Plan, Monitoring and evaluation has helped to inform delivery of water under the objectives that have been set within the Basin Plan. At a Basin scale, just in the last three years, over 200 actively managed flow events have been delivered for water birds and over 300 flow events for fish. Some native fish populations have increased, while others have remained constant and some have continued to decline. For fish, Environmental flows has been able to contribute successfully to some spawning events and aided in either maintaining populations during drought or inciting key life cycle needs such as movement. However, 
The Murray-Darling Basin is a highly modified environment, and although restoring key natural functions and processes can have benefits for native species, unintended consequences can also arise. For example, in the Murray-Darling Basin, carp and introduced fish make up the majority of biomass of fish in the basin. Delivering water to wetlands benefits this pest fish greatly and numbers of carp have increased since 2010 and provide difficulties when trying to maximise positive outcomes for native fish. This example highlights that environmental flows is not a standalone recovery mechanism and always needs to be implemented in an integrated catchment management context. In the Murray-Darling Basin, this is often referred to as complementary measures and may include restocking locally extinct fish, improving the connectivity between habitats, so for fish that might be fishways, addressing habitat degradation, and controlling pest populations such as carp. The adaptive management cycle within the Murray-Darling Basin. As the sustainable management of water dependent ecosystems in the Murray-Darling Basin is a long-term objective, it is a stage process where learning by doing in an adaptive management process is enacted. Adaptive management is a key process within environmental water delivery in the Murray-Darling Basin and within the plan. As monitoring and evaluation of water delivery occurs, learnings are captured from each event and then they are used to improve water delivery in future events. This helps to improve water delivery efficiency and lessen third party impacts such as flooding or pest species benefits as we discussed with the carp. It also helps to find multiple benefits of watering such as water delivered for one target group e.g. birds may benefit another group such as frogs or a social objective such as improving recreational conditions in the rivers e.g. fishing while still meeting the ecological objectives set out for the flow event. So the take home messages from today's lecture. Water reform takes time and the more socially complex a river basin is, the longer it usually takes. And also that collaborative processes are a key component of success. However, even in a basin as complex as the Murray-Darling Basin, it does work. Environmental water is being successfully delivered in the Murray-Darling Basin and much can be learned from this for others. Setting clear targets and objectives help to set up the implementation phases of environmental water delivery. Then the monitoring and evaluation and the adaptive management were also key components and are still key components of environmental water delivery and they allow for a learning and an increased flexibility when delivering the water.